Hi, I'm Corey King. And I'm Robert Lee. And today we'd like to talk to you about a topic that most people consider to be taboo, problematic sexual behavior of youth. First, we'll discuss what are considered problematic sexual behaviors, the differences between problematic sexual behaviors and developmentally appropriate sexual behaviors, and what caused these behaviors to occur. Then we'll talk about how these behaviors can be treated by specially trained clinicians. Problematic sexual behaviors among youth include private parts such as genitals, anus, buttocks, and breasts, as well as other body parts such as the hands and mouth. These behaviors are seen to be developmentally inappropriate and are often illegal according to state and federal laws. Problematic sexual behavior cannot be found in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual because PSD is not a disorder. Instead, it's a term used to describe a group of clinically concerning behaviors that could be the result of a trauma-related disorder, an internalizing disorder, disruptive behavior disorder, or even learning and language delays. Children with PSD do not share the same characteristics of adult sex offenders or peer rapists. Youth with problematic sexual behaviors tend to have fewer victims, fewer behaviors involving penetration, and have different motivations for their behaviors, which are generally experimental or driven by curiosity. When youth exhibit problematic sexual behaviors, it can impact the entire social support system. As PSBs often occur with siblings, cousins, or close friends of the child, the entire system needs to be involved in treatment and supportive. Other children in the home may be confused with what behaviors are considered to be normal. They may have issues among their peer groups, exhibit anxious or depressive symptoms, or become angry with other youth with PSBs. Caregivers often experience feelings of shame, embarrassment, guilt, and frustration. It can lead to division among the family, and it's difficult for the family to overcome these issues. Because of this, caregivers are heavily involved in the treatment. While the origin of problematic sexual behaviors are unknown, there are many factors that can influence a child having PSBs. The child and family's trauma history, the level of adversity they face, and disruption in their daily lives, whether or not they live in a coercive or sexualized environment, as well as individual child characteristics, all have an impact on whether or not a child will develop PSBs. While no accurate data on prevalence exists, it is known that more than one-third of sexual offenses against child victims are committed by other youth. PSBs often go unreported due to their sensitive nature and the fear of legal action and being labeled as a predator. With proper treatment, recidivism rates are as low as 2% in school-aged children and as low as 3% in adolescents. Let's talk about what treatment looks like. The most common treatment for problematic sexual behaviors is PSB-CBT, or Problematic Sexual Behavior Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. Treatment for this is divided into three different groups, preschool, school age, and adolescents. They also have corresponding caregiver groups, which matches the curriculums that the children are going through. While PSB can be treated by multisystemic therapy and trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, we will be focusing on PSB-CBTA, or Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for the Adolescent Group. The Adolescent Group has been designed for youth aged 13 to 18 who have been adjudicated for illegal sexual behavior. Youth who have not been adjudicated can also be treated, but due to the nature of these behaviors, Many of the adolescents are on probation, and treatment completion is court-ordered. Groups consist of between four and eight adolescents at a time and have open, ongoing admission. Because each module is self-contained, they do not build off of each other, and youth can enter the group at any point. Caregivers and youth are separated into different rooms for most of the session, but their groups are combined towards the end in order to review the material discussed. At the beginning of each session, the therapist will check in briefly with each teenager and parents will fill out a weekly report form, updating the treatment team on progress and difficulties experienced since the last session. Then the therapists lead their groups through that week's treatment module before combining the two groups. Once a family has completed all 11 treatment modules, they can graduate from the program and their success will be reported to their probation officer. In the first module, the family will explore who they should tell about the youth's problematic sexual behavior and how they will respond if they are confronted about it. Family members may have differing opinions on who should be informed about what they are going through. So in this module, each family member is tasked with listing all of the people they communicate with and the degree to which that person should be informed. Should they be told the entirety of the situation, limited information, or nothing at all? The family will also discuss how they will respond if somebody confronts them with questions about the youth with PSB. Therapists help the families work through pros and cons of how much to discuss with different people. 
In the end, the family comes together and combines their answers and makes a plan for how much information to share with others. The second module serves to educate teens and caregivers about the definitions of illegal sexual behavior and the legal ramifications for engaging in illegal sexual behavior. In Oklahoma, these crimes include first and second degree rape, statutory rape, lewd acts with a child under 16, sexual battery, forcible sodomy, indecent exposure, solicitation of a minor, and obscene, threatening, or harassing phone calls. It is important for the family to understand the law in order to avoid any subsequent and potentially highly consequential offenses, and to appreciate that society enforces certain standards when it comes to sexual behavior and prescribes serious penalties. Teens normally understand that some sexual behaviors can lead to trouble, but do not realize how serious that trouble may be. In Module 3, teens and caregivers will learn basic information about sexual health and reproduction. They will review information about sexually transmitted infections and teenage pregnancy, including how to prevent them from occurring. The therapist works to encourage dialogue between caregivers and their teen about sexual behaviors and other issues. They should also discuss who it is appropriate to have discussions about sex with and why getting information from peers in the media is not appropriate. Part of the sexual health discussion involves labeling male and female anatomy and their appropriate functions. We use medical terminology in order to describe these parts. By using appropriate words for body parts, Parents and teens become more comfortable discussing them with each other. Caregivers may be hesitant to participate in this module, so it's the therapist's job to make them see the importance of having these conversations with their teenager. They should pose questions like, what do you want your teenager to know about sexual health? And what do you think a caregiver's role is in guiding teens and making good sexual health decisions? The fourth module goes into detail about why certain types of sexual behavior are considered to be right or wrong. Group members are given several different scenarios as examples and then asked whether they agree or disagree with them. They provide justifications for their answers and then discuss their responses as a group. As a therapist in this module, it is important to prompt for deeper meaning behind group members' answers. For example, the teenager says that the reason he shouldn't do something is because he could get into trouble. The therapist should probe deeper and ask, even if you didn't get caught and didn't get in trouble, would it still be wrong? Guiding the group members through these scenarios helps them think critically about their behaviors. In the fifth module, teens and caregivers are taught to explore the link between their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, as well as what led up to the situation and the outcomes of the behavior. During this session, the group members are given example scenarios and asked to provide explanations about what they might think, feel, and do in these situations, and then brainstorm the potential consequences of that behavior. Caregivers are taught how to help their teenagers think through alternative behaviors and reinforce their pro-social ideas. Therapists also emphasize the importance of not arguing with their teenager and instead emphasize their role as somebody who is there to help shape their ideas. In the sixth module, the treatment team will arrange for a juvenile justice guest speaker to come talk to the group about how the legal system is involved in PSB. This session is done with youth and caregivers combined covers topics such as sex offender registration, the handling of juvenile justice records, the process of having records sealed or expunged, and what the courts look for when determining if the youth has been rehabilitated. The seventh module focuses on how to create appropriate rules for the teenager to follow and what rewards and consequences are set when rules are followed and broken. The groups practice setting hypothetical rules for example situations and then create rules that are specific to their family. Caregivers are taught how to deliver labeled praise to their teens, and also the difference between things that are considered rights and privileges. It's important for caregivers to consider their teens' input when making rules so that they're more likely to be followed. Module 8 focuses on opening up lines of communication between teens and their caregivers. This module is skill-based, and the group members have the opportunity to practice communicating with each other about a variety of topics. After reviewing basic communication skills, the teens are matched with a caregiver who is not their own to practice with. Once they have mastered communicating with that adult, they practice communicating with their own caregiver. The ninth module discusses why youth act out sexually. The teenagers are given a list of common reasons many youth have exhibited problematic sexual behaviors and then asked to mark whether or not it was a factor for them personally. Caregivers are given the same sheet and asked to rate which factors they believe impacted their child. 
Generally, the teenager and caregiver will have differing opinions on why the PSB occurred. It's important for them to be on the same page about what led up to the illegal sexual behavior so they can take appropriate steps to prevent it in the future. In the 10th module, the adolescents are given several opportunities to share and discuss the details of their PSB, whilst the cognitive behavioral emotional details are also brought into light through Inquisition. Because of the intensity of this module, there are different disclosure opportunities with caregivers separated from the adolescents and where they are combined with the adolescents. The adolescent group is required to complete the disclosure of their PSB with reading and rating other disclosures and the accompanying experiences. The caregiver group is told about what the adolescent group is undergoing in their disclosures, whilst the caregivers are asked to share the common experiences of being a caregiver for PSB adolescents. When the groups are combined, the disclosure is shared with the caregivers present and then rated for accuracy by all present. Restitution is something one does after engaging in wrongful behavior to begin setting things right. In this module, the teens will write a letter to their victim, but the letter does not need to be sent. They will also write a letter to their caregiver, and their caregiver will write a letter to them in return. The goal is for the youth to take positive steps towards apologizing and making amends for their behavior. For the restitution letters to be considered acceptable, the youth must apologize in their own words. They must show perspective taking and understanding, explain the motivation behind the thoughts and behaviors, and share what is being done to make sure that they don't happen again in the future. For the final session, the teens attend a graduation where the accomplishments of both the clients and caregivers are celebrated. When the adolescents have officially graduated, probation officers are notified about the achievement, are invited to attend the celebration of snacks, and observe the participants' awarding ceremony by receiving a signed certificate of accomplishment. In order to graduate, the teens and their caregivers must have had satisfactory attendance and have participated fully in all sessions. Throughout the course of treatment, the teenager has learned to take responsibility for their actions by disclosing their problematic sexual behavior. They've shown an increased level of maturity and impulse control and adequately made amends through letters of apology. They have also developed a treatment plan for the prevention of future CSB. If you'd like to learn more about problematic sexual behavior, visit www.ncsby.org to view extensive research and resources. Thank you for watching.